And so I'm really excited to talk with you today about automating and evidencing key compliance uh, security controls on AWS. So I'm Danny Traphagan. I am a senior startup solutions architect. I specialize in healthcare and life sciences here at AWS. And so I work with highly regulated cus customers who have highly regulated data. Um, my background is in both science and technology. I have wet lab exper experience doing tissue engineering at uh, UCSF, and then I also have worked in a series of startups, one of which just recently IPO'd in 2021. So I have a little bit of that experience as well, um, and some experience in distributed systems. And uh, each of those companies defined and created a cloud product and a cloud offering, so that's how I have experience with AWS as well. I've been at AWS for about two years now, and I've learned a lot about how we do governance and compliance um, and it's we have a lot of really good tooling out there and that's the part that's overwhelming so we're gonna unpack that debunk maybe some common you know ideas that you might have about compliance and um, yeah so I hope you enjoy our talk today so let's talk about what we're gonna talk about in detail. Um, so first I'm gonna address compliance and why it's important. I'm gonna start with a fun analogy. Why? Because you should make compliance discussions fun, right? Um, since they normally can be kind of painful, right? Mo emotionally and mentally. Speaking of mentally, I'm going to talk about three different mental models, okay? And these mental models are really important to lay a foundation to your compliance house. Uh, it will really help you kind of shift your mindset towards cloud, the cloud journey with compliance in, entirely. So I think it's really important to have that before we move on to some of the meatier parts. Speaking of the meatier parts of the talk today, we're gonna to be talking about tooling. So what are the different tools on AWS? How do I use them? How do I use them together to really show, evidence, automate, and monitor my compliance posture on AWS? Those are the three things that we're gonna discuss in detail, is that uh, automation process, the monitoring process, and the evidencing process to the auditor, okay? All right, next, where does that leave you? Okay, now you have you know, a, a fun, funky little analogy with cute little drawings, you have three mental models, you understand the tooling, but where do you go from there? Well, then I'm gonna offer some getting started guidance and show you some of the solutions that we publish that might be helpful for you, um, especially getting into things like conformance packs, which are really handy and dandy, um, and talking a lot about how to implement continuous compliance from an architecture, architecture principles perspective. Next, I'll do some customer examples. So I find that it's nice to kind of build to a point where you can see what other customers are doing as well on AWS um, and what good looks like. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about those as well. And then, like I said earlier, I would appreciate if we could take Q&A in the hall. That way I can get to know you um, and we'll, we'll chat in a little bit more detail that way. All right. So let's unpack this whole compliance thing, right? Um, Ensuring that you have proper data governance controls to meet your compliance requirements, it's not too dissimilar from taking a hike, right? It is a journey, it is ongoing, um, and hikes can be risky, right? But they're often worth that risk if you've planned for them appropriately. Now, when you plan for a hike, you're probably thinking about the inventory of the resources that you need, right? I'm like, ah, I need to pack some food. I need to make a good lunch at that beautiful vista that I'm gonna have at the end of this hike. And then you want to pack them securely for your journey. But when you have valuable resources, this also means that you have something that others might want, right? And that's, that's the rub. That can put you at risk if you haven't planned for things appropriately. And when you don't plan, bad things happen, okay? And so this is what we want to avoid. And when we plan ahead for these threats, we can develop controls that we can use in an automated fashion to protect our resources. In this example, we plan to have bear spray in the event we come across a bear on our lovely hike. These drawings were all done by me, by the way, so if you need any artists in your life, right, I, I will be taking that at, at a premium, so um, you can also talk to me about that in the hallway. Um, okay, so what if we don't know how to use our tools properly? And this is something I see a lot with my customers um, on, on AWS. Don't tell them that I said that. There might be one of them in the room right now. <laughs> Just kidding, Lance. Um, you're great. But you know, what if we don't know how to use our tooling properly, right? That's where things go wrong um, at, with our lovely friend here, as you can see. And if you think that this is silly, well, bad things can happen on a hike. But what about? Uh, 
you know, when we actually encounter a situation in the real world with an auditor, right? Um, what is the cost point there that we might see? Well, uh, it's not going to be a pretty picture when the auditor says, hey, you know, you have, not, you have not implemented the proper governance and compliance controls, and here's some issues. Because what happens? Fines. Big ones. And they're not fun, right? Um, and if you think this analogy is silly, just ask the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation, where they say, listen, bear spray does not work like bug spray. We would like to not have to repeat that again. So in the case of tool misuse on, misuse on a hike, at least where bears are involved, you could get mauled. Um, and that's not a great outlook. But what about getting mauled financially by an auditor? Let's take a specific example, right, where the stakes are similar, similarly high um, within the context of GDPR. And for those who, of you who don't know, I'm pretty sure everybody in the room, based upon chatting with you all, does. But GDPR is the Global Data Protection um, Regulation. And this is an EU regulation. And, and in its, uh, defined in its, um, body is a, um, a, a level of violation. So there'll be severe violation, egregious violation, and so on. An egregious violation could be 4% of your global annual turnover, right? Or 2 million, two million euros, whichever might be higher. That is a pretty significant risk, right? Um, especially if you're caught in violation of that. And that's what we really want to avoid here are those types of issues for you in the cloud. And that's what I advise my customers on. Okay, so let's figure out how we can really develop automated controls using the right tools that everybody can use appropriately in the event of a threat, either internally or externally caused, right? Okay, and ultimately, when we are successful in keeping our resources and our data secure, well, we're happy and good things happen, right? And that's what we want for our organization. So next, we're gonna talk about common challenges with cloud compliance, because there are quite a few, right? So first, data is an ever-evolving landscape. How many of you are familiar with the concept of the three Vs? Okay, just a few, so we'll do a quick recap on that. This is volume, variety, and velocity of your data. And those increase over time, especially in the cloud, where uh, you continually onboard new use cases, right? And you're constantly growing your data volumes. You're constantly getting a shift of the variety of data based upon those new use cases. And it's coming in at an ever faster pace because of what, right? The presence of mobile technology as well. So this is a challenge for us with compliance because the landscape shifts for us, right, in, in flight. Second, everyone who uses our cloud computing resources at our organization has differing cloud skill sets. I was talking with some of you in the audience. Some of you are just getting started with your compliance journey. Some of you are cybersecurity experts. Some of you, this is your bread and butter. This is what you do every day. And so how do you make sure that you are standing on the shoulders of giants and that is the focus for everybody within your organization? Well, the answer is to automate. <laughs> That's how you can ensure it entirely, right? So we're gonna talk a lot about that. Next is global distribution. I was talking with some of you also about you going into new markets and entering different places where regulation standards are totally different than you have today. So global distribution is another key challenge when it comes to compliance. The rate of innovation. That's another place where things can get a little tricky, especially when you're developing new use cases and you have to be able to manage those um, as they come along. And then there's dynamic compliance needs, right? So things change over time, and we end up developing new strategies or innovating around different solutions, and we need to be able to uh, have dynamic compliance needs that, um, that we can change over time, too. And then choosing the right tools. This is the last one that I'm gonna unpack a lot during our session today. That's what I'm gonna be talking about with you, is which tools should you use on AWS for compliance? Because there's a lot, right? This is a lot of tooling to have for security governance and compliance, right? It's just the sheer list of this. Um, I, I can see why it's challenging for people that are just getting started. And so I wanna kind of streamline through some of that and really bring up with you what can create an effective strategy on AWS and what that consists of based upon our own learnings here as we created these services. Okay, let me have a sip of water and then we're gonna talk about mental models.
Okay, so this is a foundation that I talked about before for our house, right? So let's dig in and talk about our needs when thinking about compliance and governance controls. To be successful in reaching these, these types of goals and avoiding those egregious fines I talked about earlier, we must first have an overall understanding of what's in scope for us to demonstrate versus AWS. So we need mental models, right, to understand that. We also need to uh, make sure that we have a plan for risk management. How are we doing that? That's another mental model right there. We'll talk about what that is. And lastly, we need the support of tooling to really break out automation, monitoring, and evidencing on AWS, right? Those are the three things that are really key to understand for governance and compliance. So <clears throat> I know a lot of you are, uh, are familiar with some of the AWS tooling concepts and some of these mental models, but for those of you who aren't, I'm gonna quickly go through what this is. What you're looking at right here is the shared responsibility model on AWS. Um, and so, you know, in the olden days, right, when we had bare metal servers in rooms, we were in charge of everything that you see on this slide. There was no orange and blue distinction. There was no above the line and below the line. With AWS now and the emergence of cloud computing, now all of a sudden AWS has to maintain its compliance posture of resources as well, right? We have third party attest attestations, we have certifications, we have things that we can expose to you and I'll talk about what tooling we expose that to you in in just a moment, but there's above the line and below the line. And that really comes down to the types of tools that you're using as well. So there's also a distinction between serverless or if you're running you know, self-managed EC2 where you have to do patch uh, you know, updates and things like that versus something serverless where the service team is going to do that for you on your behalf, right? But that's all published as well, and I'll talk a little bit about that where you can find those resources um, in AWS Artifact. But ultimately what you need to understand is that you are responsible for the things in the blue and AWS is responsible for the things in the orange. We also have a white paper on that too if you want further dirty detail on it. Uh, we, we don't have time to go into the depths of it um, for this talk. Next, I'm gonna build this out in advance so I can talk about it really quickly because we have some people that are already familiar with this in the room, but ultimately what you need to understand is the well-architected framework is how AWS visualizes properly built architectures on AWS. This is like what we have learned internally watching customers over and over again build software applications. These key principles are what are essential to build proper, healthy, functioning software apps in the cloud, okay? So the first of which is the operational excellence pillar. This is focusing on running your systems and monitoring them and continually involving processes uh, at your organization. And that's something that we're gonna talk about in terms of uh, continuous compliance, right? So operational excellence is definitely a key part of how we think about compliance in the cloud. Security, <laughs> I feel like I don't even need to explain that. Obviously, that is a very important focus when we're talking about uh, defining our cloud operations in general. Who has access to what resources, right? That's something that we'll unpack a bit in a, in a minute. Um, and then next would be reliability, right? We want reliable architectures. We want to make sure that we're meeting our SLAs. And when you start encrypting things, yeah, there's a little bit of an impact right there to performance. So it's something that we need to think about and plan out ahead of time to understand how reliably we've architected things. And then performance efficiency, right? So how, how efficient are we in our performance? Are we getting the bang for our buck on these cloud resources? Which brings us to our, our next point, cost optimization. And there's a healthy tension between those two pillars. Lastly, sustainability is something AWS introduced this past year to focus on our carbon footprint. Uh, it's just something good to know about that we're thinking more about this now as well um, because it is a important thing to, to, uh, to note during our climate crisis here. Okay, so now that we've talked about how AWS thinks about things, let's talk about, um, and I was having a conversation just in the beginning about this, let's, let's talk about how the auditor thinks about things, right? So this is the three lines model, okay? And this is the standard that's presented by the Institute of Internal Auditors. And what this standard does is it, um, is it establishes three different lines of defense for an organization to have strong governance. So this is how the auditor sees you if you have strong governance. Okay. So the first line of defense is where you are going to manage risk. This is where you identify the controls that will help you mitigate risk. 
services like AWS Config, which I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you some screen grabs of it in console, and um, you can see a lot of the nitty gritty about it. But services like AWS Config, AWS Control Tower, Backup, uh, AWS Systems Manager, and AWS Cloud Trail, which is basically our audit log um, service, these are going to help you to ensure that you can manage risk, right? Which is that first line of defense. The second line of defense is going to talk about having visibility into your risk. So that's that monitoring piece, right? Um, and basically what that line of defense uh, imparts is that you need to have a way of uh, having this visibility so, and, and having a place where you can oversee this risk. Um, this is what's gonna inform your process for mitigating any sort of non-compliant issues. Um, and services like Security Hub and AWS Config have features that allow you to do that in the second line of defense. And what's really cool about them too is they also, when things get flagged, you can auto-remediate um, non-compliant resources. You can see that across multiple accounts and, and it's a really nice feature of doing that automation step, but also having that monitor piece as well. And you will see what that looks like in console today. All right, the third line of defense is where you provide assurance of your risk. So this is where our auditor comes in. Uh, this is the orangish box there on, on the far right of the screen. Um, and so this is where you're going to have that validation step that you are HIPAA compliant, for example. And for this, you need services like Audit Manager and CloudTrail uh, in order to help you with that. Okay. So now that we understand the mental models, we have the foundation to our compliance house, we're gonna discuss AWS services that help you automate, monitor, and evidence your compliance needs. So, how many of you have heard of or used Control Tower? Great, this is a healthy show of hands. That makes me happy for the recording. That was about 50% of the folks. So, if you're just getting started, and some of you are, as I know, um, in building out your AWS multi-account strategy, I highly recommend the use of AWS Control Tower. This is a great tool for setting up governance in a dynamic multi-account cloud environment. Um, what Control Tower provides is uh, a way to set up landing zones that make use of AWS organizations. And AWS organizations are great in that they really pair nicely with the hierarchy that already exists within your company. So that way you can start thinking about who, who does what where in terms of deploying resources. Um, and how do you do that? Well, with things called SCPs, which are service control policies. How many of you have set up an SCP before? Hey, this is great. That was about 40% of the hands. So automation is really key when you're growing your cloud usage, as you know. Um, and so using tools like this uh, allow you to really kind of do things in a less manual and painful sense. Um, and so I highly recommend uh, Control Tower if you haven't given it a look before. Um, you can also detect violations through um, AWS config rules in addition to this piece on Control Tower. And so, um, you know, basically kind of starting to get towards that compliance of code mentality where not just infrastructure is code, but now we're starting to enforce what resources that we're launching from a continuous mindset, right? with just you know, some code snippets that can easily be version controlled and shared throughout our organization. Um, so, so that's a really nice pattern um, you know, to have in your architecture on AWS. Then there's two types of controls that we ultimately need. So we need to be able to prevent compliance issues from happening, um, and then we also need to be able to detect those issues once they occur. So this is preventative controls versus detective controls. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about those types of controls. Now, okay, ways to manage, ways to provision, and ways to assure to auditors that you are compliant, right? These are kind of the, in a nutshell, tools that I think map to those different causes, um, and I'm going to go ahead and talk through each of those. So we already kind of chatted about AWS organizations and Control Tower, but ultimately on this management layer, um, what you want to do is control who's doing what and what happens in your environment. So an example of this that I talked about on the previous slide was SCPs for your organizations, right? Um, and this lets you restrict a user from being able to perform actions that don't coincide with your compliance standards. So you can also extend that functionality. I talked with somebody who is interested in fine grain access controls. You can extend that functionality with tools like IAM, right? Which, are, um, which is AWS uh, Identity and Access Management Service. 
So this allows you to restrict a user from being able to perform actions that don't really con coincide with your compliance standards. Um, and you can also extend the functionality of IAM policies as well to set those controls at the individual per permission le level um, on your cloud infrastructure, which I find particularly handy and a good thing to know about um, if you're just getting started. In terms of provisioning, this is how things are going to get created. So there's a number of different ways of going about this. I'm sure many of you are familiar with AWS CloudFormation. Um, and so, so and some of you might come from a background where you use Terraform. How many Terraform users do we have? OK, good. I'm glad I included as little discussion on OPA then as well. Um, wow, that was really healthy showing of hands. How many of you use CloudFormation? OK, also a healthy showing of hands. How many of you use both? Yeah, and that's what I would expect. Um, it seems like people kind of use one or the other, but a huge chunk of, of customers use both. So provisioning is how we're going to create things, right? And, and there are good tools for this within the context of CloudFormation and Terraform, which support us to standardize an approach for provisioning our, our infrastructure throughout our organization. But with compliance, you know, what? Once you do all of that, once you get all of that set up, you've got those management tools, you've got the provisioning tools, well now how do we evaluate our evidence that we have these in play? And that's where tooling like um, CloudFormation Guard and Open Policy Agent can really help us out. CloudFormation Guard, um, specifically, I'll show an architectural diagram um, as well as a code snippet here that I'm gonna talk through with you, but it can be really handy to uh, implement rules and a rule is an, ex a, a, an example of a rule here that you see on the screen is for EBS volumes. So in this case, we need to see rules that ensure that our volumes are encrypted, a very common thing amongst a lot of different compliance postures and standards. Um, and so we can ensure that they're encrypted and we can also require them to be only GP2 or GP3. GP3 is more uh, cost performant, by the way, so if you are still on GP2 instances, I urge you to shift to GP3, but this is not an EBS volume talk, so I will move on. Um, and then that they're only launched in the two regions we have listed there. So for a, vo a volume to be defined in, an a in a CloudFormation script, it will have to meet these requirements to even take off, to pass, and to build. So let's take a look at what the architecture is all about for this. So how do you use AWS CloudFormation Guard, and what does it look like? So you start with that CloudFormation template or, or Terraform or whatever, um, and then you're gonna be using some CICD pipeline, whether that's Jenkins or in the example here, I have code pipeline, but whatever that might be, okay? And so you're going to, um, once that merge is gonna be detected, right, in a specific branch of your repo, what's gonna happen next is that um, the, it will, it's gonna run code build. And code build runs the CloudFormation Guard tool against the template that you just tried to launch with the rules that you defined already for compliance. So once the run is completed, then it's gonna pass or fail, as you see here. Um, and so if it does pass, then it's gonna fail with an error, and, and, and then if it passes, it can pass it on to the next step for those desired resources uh, in the infrastructure with the rules, conditions for compliance to be met. What I like about this is this is a really simple architecture that allows you to deploy a preventative control um, on AWS. So this is kind of one of the first architectures I'd like to point out um, as a way of doing preventative controls in a pretty easy and streamlined way. All right, more preventative control. So this AWS config is really an amazing tool for governance and compliance. Um, if you need to know about governance and compliance on AWS, I would highly recommend you dig into AWS config. I'm gonna be explaining a bit about it right now. Um, it helps us to track changes to our configurations, evaluate the compliance of our resources, and visualize this across multiple accounts in multiple regions in one single pane of glass view. Um, you can also actually use SQL queries as well to get more insights on the data in AWS config. And we're gonna talk about what that AWS config data consists of right now and what AWS config looks like really from the AWS mindset, right? Like how we see AWS config. So at the very core, which you see on the bottom of the screen here, you have an AWS config recording, right? This is really the core primitive of not only AWS config, but of many different services on AWS, including the ones that you see at the top of this diagram. So AWS security hub controls, AWS backup policies, AWS control tower guardrails, all those things we talked about that you've already used. Um, 
and then AWS Audit Manager Resource Assessments, Conformance Packs, which I will talk a little bit more about and actually give you a direct QR code, which you can scan um, to, to check out com Conformance Packs. They're super handy. Um, and then AWS Firewall Manager Rules. So let's talk about how this is built. Well, in, a config recording is uh, under the hood uh, the way that we track changes to configuration items. Anytime you create or update a resource in your environment, we create a configuration item and we deliver it to an S3 bucket. That's what a config recording is, okay? And so then you can see how resources are gonna change over time. You can also use three par third party resources uh, with custom config recordings as well. So um, this is kind of nice too because you can take those third party resources and it allows you to track resources that might reside elsewhere, like on-premises, for example, um, because not everybody is 100% on the cloud or cloud native today. So this is a nice way of kind of having a hybrid solution to, to track those changes. And then config rules are the way that we're gonna evaluate every single resource for compliance. They're basically managed policies from the compliance terminology perspective. This is just a managed policy. Um, and these are rules that you want your resources to ultimately adhere to. Config rules are the way that we're gonna implement that. And there's different types, as you see on the screen here. There's managed, there's custom, there's change triggered, and there's periodic. So a managed config rule, right, would be the example that I brought up earlier with CloudFormation Guard of those EBS volumes, right? So we detect a change, you know, the resource is either uh, encrypted or not encrypted, it needs to be encrypted based upon our rule set, that's a managed policy. A custom policy would be where you want to deploy something um, outside of that. Uh, an example of, um, of this would just be to generate a custom configuration item. Um, and then another Another uh, set of options is change triggered or periodic. So change triggered would be if a resource is changed and periodic comes in from the auditor lens where um, we are looking to show compliance within a certain time period within the Epic, like 24 hours or what have you. What I really like at the end of the day about AWS Config is the ability to auto remediate non-compliant resources. That, was, that is where that automation step comes in, and I'm gonna show you what that looks like in console. How many of you have already played around with AWS Config? Okay, yeah, that was maybe 20% of hands, so not as many people. Um, and I, I think this is really handy for you to be able to um, focus on compliance from a mindset of where you're trying to automate what really matters in your AWS accounts. And uh, another thing to kind of mention about this is billing is also impacted with this um, core primitive of the AWS config recording. So some of you have already played around with AWS config, probably know that what shows up on your bill, if you're using these other services up here, is actually that config recording piece rather than uh, those, the names of those services. And that's because that's, that's where the magic actually is. Okay. So again, the big takeaway here is that AWS config recordings really underpin a lot of the AWS tooling around governance and compliance. So you might be asking yourself, okay, well then why do we need other tooling? <laughs> why are there so many logos on that page Well, um, that I showed you earlier? Well, I will kind of unpack some of that. That's where the monitoring and evidencing pieces come in, right? And then different ways that we need to do that. And then I'll also talk a little bit about conformance packs as well as a really easy way to automate um, configuration in the cloud. Okay, so let's talk about what it looks like in your console. All right, so you can see here that um, when you need to set up a, uh, or when you need to detect a compliance issue, you'll see that your resources are indicated as either compliant or non-compliant. So um, that's just under the compliance pane over there. It's detected for S3 buckets, public access, right? It's detected 11 non-compliant resources there. And you'll also note the remediation action panel on this screen, okay? So there's not one that's set, but you can set up a remediation action so that you don't have to go to all 11 buckets in whatever accounts they might reside and fix that manually, which is nice. So you can kind of automate this. It's less error prone, it's less manual. This is the part that I really like about AWS Config. Also just to note um, that where that hyphen is, those resources haven't been launched. The next thing we talked about was the conformance pack bit on the previous slide, right? And so 
what is that? Well, you can see on this screenshot here, it says conformance pack. So all of these rules were managed from a conformance pack. And what is a conformance pack? Well, it's just a collection of rules. That's all it is. So a use case example of this would be to deploy 100 rules into multiple accounts. So you go to account one, and then you have to deploy, deploy all those 100 rules. Then you go to account two, and you have to deploy all those 100 rules, and three, and so on. And this is tedious at best and error prone at worst. And so what a conformance pack does for you um, is, is really to help you have a single arnable entity that you can use Right? Um, and, and then this makes it a lot easier to apply things for an entire organization, which is probably what you're doing in managing the governance and compliance posture on AWS for your company, right? Um, and so this is just a simple one, one way, one, one click way to deploy this. Okay. Also important to note is that all of, all of these rules are immutable. So once they're deployed, you can ensure that a user doesn't a accidentally delete them, which is really important. We want these rules to be immutable. Um, and there are many different types of conformance packs that we have. We even have them actually for operational best practices for S3. And this is an area where I see my customers get wrapped around the axle. They throw everything into S3 standard, right? They don't, they don't actually you know, understand their access patterns and so they don't use things like intelligent tiering to understand those access patterns and then write those S3 policies to transition them into archival types, which can save tons of money for you, right? And so that kind of goes back to those well-architected principles we talked about, where things sort of interrelate here, right? H how do we do things from the mindset of also being cost-optimized um, and efficient with the resources that we're utilizing? Okay, and then next, you can also simplify um, your reporting step um, and you can do so by getting the status of an entire pack. So you can do this manually, but it would be really tedious. Conformance packs allow you to just get the status of everything around these resources just directly. And there's lots of sample conformance packs, which can give you an idea of how to map controls to AWS config rules, as we went over on the previous slides, um, and guidance around each of those controls. So this is a really nice AWS declarative way to do things um, based upon our understanding of compliance posture and how we're assuring it ourselves. So um, that's not to say, okay, now you go and you use this conformance pack and you're compliant. There's a lot more to compliance than that, but at least this makes the cloud journey of compliance a bit easier. So I like to bring it up for folks. And then, the uh, QR code on the screen, just to point that out to you, is for operational best practices for HIPAA security, for example. So already here is a conformance pack that applies directly to HIPAA um, as a compliance standard. And so you can see how these can be handy. We have them for several different industries. Um, and so please check out conformance packs. That it'll save you a lot of time and headache. Uh, I guess I should ask, how many people have used them already? Oh, okay, like maybe less than 10 hands. All right, so glad we discussed that and hopefully it's something you can check out. Okay. So we talked about config rules and we talked about conformance packs and how they help us to implement detective controls. And so config rules, as you'll recall, um, after the resources are created in our environment, we are checking to ensure that they're provisioned against our desired rules. Um, and with conformance packs, what we're seeing is that customers are deploying conformance packs that are being used against those operational best practices for compliance regimes like I talked about. So just think of them as one step further than a service like Security Hub. Um, they're a little bit more flexible and are meant to extend what was pr prescribed in, um, in Security Hub. They're a bit more hybrid. They're that declar declarative guidance um, for you from AWS. And AWS config is the core to compliance and again, that's just the big takeaway take here. So this, hopefully you're seeing that that slide in the beginning with all those tools has become a little bit more simplified um, and demystified. Okay, AWS Systems Manager. We call this Operations Hub. This allows you to group resources and visualize data on the resources, how they're running, and lastly, how to take action on the resources that are performing. One feature that I'd like to call out is Quick Setup. Um, this is a great way to perform configuration actions, and one of those is through AWS Config. Um, has anybody done that? No? Okay, no hands. Well, you can do that. Um, and if you have a large environment to deploy AWS config in and you aren't already using Control Tower, then you could potentially use Quick Setup um, to apply a configuration recording. And um, you can also do Quick Setup uh, for conformance packs too, um, 
like, like I said. So uh, really, this is a good way for you to write out the remediation actions that you'd like to take place. For example, an S3 bucket that is unencrypted but should be encrypted. So with the automation feature of Systems Manager, you can write API actions that you want to use to fix those non-compliant resources. And I think that's kind of like the end point we all want to get into, is just being able to have an API action to manage this stuff rather than deal with it all painfully and manually. Um, so this is a good way of doing that. Another couple features worth mentioning would be Run Command and Inventory Patch Manager. They do a lot of what they sound like. Run Command you'd use against large amounts of EC2 resources to ensure that you're setting them um, in a compliant way. Uh, you can write a document to automate this at scale as well. And then uh, Inventory and Patch Management, that sounds exactly like what it is. It can be used for patching and networking configurations as well. Okay, CloudTrail, a very, very important tool in managing risk because it is our managed audit trail platform, right? That's literally what it is. It's for audit trails. Um, it creates a trail at every single action, logging into the console, CLI actions, API actions, et cetera. And if I asked you how many of you were using Control Tower, I would expect 100% of the hands to go up into the air. Why? Because it's enabled by default. That's how important it, AWS thinks it is. It's enabled by default for 90 days. In, so um, there's two types of trails. Uh, you can configure a management trail and a data events trail. Management is for the creation and updating of a resource. Um, and then for data events, this is gonna be operations within that resource. So something like an S3 read or an S3 write. And many compliance frameworks require the ability to track operations on these files. Um, an audit trail of data helps us do that. So that's why control, or pardon me, that is why CloudTrail can be really helpful. All right, let's talk a wee bit about Security Hub. So this is where you're gonna get a comprehensive view of security alerts and, um, and your security posture across all of your security accounts and regions. This data is gonna get collected from different AWS services like Amazon Macy, Amazon Inspector, and Guard Duty. And you can also have partner solutions there as well that take actions on those findings. A lot of my customers in the highly regulated healthcare and life sciences industries do rely on those partner functions. Um, and this allows you to have a clear overview of your security posture across your whole entire organization. Okay. All right, so we've talked about the tools. Where are we at in the journey? Now we need to talk about how to get ready for an audit, right? So, some tooling that can help you with the audit step. AWS Audit Manager. This is gonna help you evidence your needs when, it comes for, when, it, when an audit comes up. Um, it allows you to collect necessary information uh, for an audit, and there are frameworks which are control sets for different compliance regimes, like HIPAA, High Trust, et cetera, and these control sets are going to automatically collect information using Security Hub, CloudTrail, and AWS Config. There might also be some manual components as well that you need to collect because not everything is gonna be in the cloud, right? You're gonna have physical security needs as well um, to document for the auditor. For example, do you have a security guard outside? Um, those types of things can be requirements for certain compliance standards. So just note that that's something that you can also uh, ensure is in one single location through Audit Manager, which is nice. Um, and this is kind of that push to auditor uh, solution. So you can, you can actually manage towards the audits by everything getting delivered as, an, as a PDF in S3. And so then that's what gets pushed to the auditor. Whether or not the auditor likes that is between you and the auditor. <laughs> I understand that some auditors do not like uh, any automated tooling being involved in the process whatsoever, but this is a really nice way for you to be able to, um, to post that for the auditor to observe and check off on. So this tool really helps you in the third line of defense, which is that assurance of risk management piece. Um, and so now we've kind of completed the whole bit of the three lines of defense model, right? We have all the tooling for each of those lines of defense, um, and this is how we see the important relevant tools in AWS to ensure that you are thinking about things the way an auditor really wants you to be thinking about them. Okay, now next is AWS Artifact. AWS Artifact is another tool that you can use, and this is our self-service uh, compliance portal where you can obtain AWS reports. This is where you can find agreements such as the BAA. Are you familiar with BAAs in the crowd? 
Yes, only a couple of people. Okay, so that's just the business associate addendum. Right, you need to sign a BAA for certain compliance steps, um, and then NDA uh, as well is hosted there. And so you can review and sign all of those agreements, but also you can monitor. Remember the shared responsibility model? There's a reason why I went over that. So you can actually monitor uh, the security and compliance posture of AWS within this tool. You can download our artifacts, our third-party attestations, our certifications right there within the console, which I think is nice because everything is up to date. You don't have to go and like grab it or email your account manager and be like, hey, dude, <laughs> do you know where this is? Because <laughs> I have a SOC 2 report coming up and it is in a very short while, so please get back to me quickly. No, you can just do that in the console. Okay, and then here on the screen, we have an example uh, that I just pulled up from my console of the AWS High Trust CSF certification letter. So this is just an example of some of the certifications that you can grab from us to be able to furnish those to your auditor and say, hey, AWS takes care of that part, right? Okay, now we have made it to the crucial moment where we have getting started guidance to discuss. So, we have a firm understanding of what tools are relevant for compliance and governance on AWS. Let's start about how do we build out these architectures, right? And we have a lot of resources for this to help you prepare for the next step after you've got kind of all these other preceding steps done. And so let's dig into this. First, um, and these are all QR codes because whenever I attend a talk and then there's no way for me to get the links that they're talking about, I get really frustrated. So hopefully this is helpful because uh, you can just grab it and then you don't have to wait for the recording or the slides to get posted. So this one is actually for HIPAA. It is a quick start and reference architecture. And the quick start is for people in healthcare and life science, uh, in the healthcare industry or really life sciences industry where HIPAA is pertinent. Um, and it includes a CloudFormation template, and that's automatically going to deploy the environment and configure AWS resources. Probably the most helpful element in this entire, um, once you go to the link in this entire thing, I find for my customers is the security controls matrix. And what that is, is uh, it actually defines um, the architectural decisions, components, and configurations from a cloud perspective that map to the HIPAA security controls. So, um, this is very useful so that you can actually see an entire grid of where AWS and where the compliance rules need to be set and, and how, right? So example, right, would be like all S3 buckets are encrypted, no public read, you know, things like that from an informed HIPAA perspective. So I often point customers to that, and it's especially helpful for folks that are just entering into a new compliance regulatory standard that they have to have so that they can get a sense and get their bearings on what that consists of. Okay, also just a quick note, I know I talked about this earlier, just deploying a quick start is not going to ensure that you are compliant. You need to do the other steps that we discussed as well, right, to, to make sure that you are checking all of those boxes. High trust, okay, so this quick start deploys a model environment for um, AWS to have organizations that work um, with workloads that fall in the scope of uh, high trust. And what high trust is, is the Health Information Trust Alliance and Common Security Framework. It's an architecture that maps out certain te um, technical requirements to achieve high trust. And what I want to say too is that even though we have a lot of healthcare examples and life sciences examples, these exist also for other industries, right? So the really big takeaway here is that you can do quick starts, you can use conformance packs for other industries, and this fits really nicely into that continuous compliance goal that we're trying to achieve. So just know that these resources are available. But um, for those of you that are interested, right, this builds on core security principles, right? We want this builds on well-architected principles that we talked about. We want a highly available architecture. We want it to span two AZs. We want a management VPC. We want a production VPC. We want separate VPCs for important reasons, right? Um, and we want to make sure that we have public and private subnets uh, allocated accordingly in our own virtual network so our networking is secure. We want uh, also to ensure in the public subnets that we have things like NAT gateways um, to manage the outbound internet access and traffic. Um, in the managed VPC, we want to have a Linux Bastion host, an auto scaling group, an inbound SSH access um, to EC2, for example, in the private subnet. So, 
So these are all things that have mapped to various security controls. And so uh, those are already able to be deployed within the quick start. So that's kind of the big takeaway here. Um, and let's see, I wanna make sure that I kind of just summarize this based on the interest of time. Um, you can see kind of a three-tier web architecture here. Obviously, this is somewhat of a canned architecture, but for those of you who are just getting started, this can be really helpful because it gives you a sense of what good looks like and also how it maps to security controls. Like, this is what you're going to build out to ensure that you're um, eligible for these various uh, sorts of compliance regimes. Okay. Another thing to note too is AWS Config Rules is here, uh, no surprise there, and that's to monitor deployment configuration. Um, okay. GXP, this is definitely getting more public awareness, especially post-pandemic. Um, what is GXP? It is shorthand for Good Practice Quality Guidelines and Regulations. This is a common place for production of biopharmaceutical products, which we had to do very quickly in the past couple of years um, and at scale. And so this is a standard that was recently published, uh, or this is a uh, blog post, the link here, it that was recently published to address this. Um, the pace of product in in innovation in this industry is often really constrained by risk management. Right? That's what really slows it down, and for a lot of industries, I'd say. So our goal here is really to enable innovation and streamline these processes to ensure that compliance is gonna be able to meet regulatory requirements. Um, and so we have some best practices and recommendations, but ultimately, the goal here is really to minimize risks, reduce overall um, qualification timelines, provide point in time traceability, and ultimately get a faster product time to market. Okay, so customer story time. Now you can put down your phones because there's no QR codes left in the presentation. <laughs> Just kidding, there is still one more QR code. Um, this is actually a customer example of threat detection at CrowdStrike. Did anybody see CrowdStrike's booth at the big expo hall? Yeah? And I'm sure based upon what you do in this room and those of you who I talked to, that you're familiar with what CrowdStrike builds, um, which is a threat detection platform. Okay, so this is a pretty cool s customer story about their Falcon product. Um, and so what they did is they integrated an Amazon EventBridge and Falcon Horizon. And so CrowdStrike has developed a real-time cloud-based solution that allows you to detect threats in less than a second. Okay, this solution uses CloudTrail, it uses EventBridge, um, and CloudTrail, like we said before, right, that's our audit trail tool, um, and it, it's ultimately for the governance, compliance, and operational auditing piece, and, and doing the risk auditing piece for, for CrowdStrike. EventBridge, how they use that is as a serverless event bus to make it easier to build event-driven applications at scale. And they maximize the advantage of the EDA, the event-driven architecture, by integrating with EventBridge, um, as shown on this diagram here. And what EventBridge is doing is it's allowing observing CloudTrail logs and event streams. And so this also is gonna simplify log centralization as well um, in multiple accounts. So it's a direct source to target integration for all of those accounts. Um, and Within their customer accounts, EventBridge, what it's going to do is uh, those rules are going to listen for the local cloud trail and stream each activity as a centralized event bridge um, that's hosted by CrowdStrike. So that's kind of how they thought about it. This is merging sort of event detection, real-time event-driven architecture with compliance, right, with that threat detection. And so that's something you can think about too and keep in your back pocket as a potential reference architecture. Um, their event-driven platform really detects advers adversarial behaviors in general from the event streams in real time. Um, and this detection is performed against incoming events in conjunction with historical events as well. Um, the context that comes from connecting new and historical events together uh, minimizes the false positive chance that they might have and also improves their alert efficacy. So doing that kind of historical and fresh um, evaluation is really important. And then finally, the events are actually enriched with CrowdStrike's threat intelligence data to provide additional insight um, of the attack to SOC analysts and incident responders. So I think this is a really cool approach and nice architecture, um, and you can check out more there at that link. Okay, so next we are going to look at some 
uh, customer testimonials from highly regulated industries. First is DNA Nexus. It's an American company that provides cloud-based data analysis and management platform for DNA sequence data. And second is Bristol Myers Squibb. It's a global bio biopharmaceutical company whose mission is to discover, develop, and deliver innovative medicines that help patients prevail over diseases overall. Um, and so respectively, what Richard Daly says is uh, basically that uh, with AWS, they've been able to create uh, clinical trials and genomic analyses in a secure and compliant way. And then uh, the director, executive director of cloud computing at Bristol Myers Squibb says that their data residency and control tower adds to um, a, program, a way of programmatically setting up guard trails, uh, guardrails and data controls. And as their data regulations evolve, which we see is a very common pattern, they say that um, it really helps them to assist with compliance and ease innovation to serve patients all around the world. So this is how customers are using some of this tooling today. And with that, we can do Q&A out in the hall. Uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, your participation. Really appreciate it. I hope that was helpful for you um, and happy to chat with you outside.